now time for an engagement with the psychology of fear and overcoming fear to speak a foreign language, as delivered by Dr. Veruda Kalyavadana, consultant psychiatrist at the base hospital Babadinia, before which Dr. Kalyavadana will be formally introduced by Dr. Shashini Thenavadu, head of the Department of English Language Teaching of the University of Colombo. Dr. Venura Pajewadana, who is a product of the University of Colombo and is now a consultant psychiatrist attached to the Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka, and is now based in the base hospital, Dambadenia. He has work experience in both Sri Lanka and Australia. Dr. Pajewadana has special academic and clinical interests in personality disorders substance abuse, and positive psychology. He has publications at both local and international levels on subjects related to various mental health conditions. Now, I would like to call upon and invite Dr. Padana to deliver his talk titled, Psychology of Fear and Overcoming Fear to Speak a Foreign Language. Over to you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, well, uh, uh, as you might see, I'm not extremely fluent in English. Uh, maybe I took a year to qualify to do this talk. But uh, you know, I can get by, as they say in Australia. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, to talk about psychology of fear, let me start with the uh, story. Uh, this is a story I heard in one of the one of those TED talks uh, in 17 and 18th century. Uh, the centuries, uh, whale hunting is one of the most lucrative businesses. And in 1890s, one day in 1890s, the whale, whale ship Essex was hit by a uh, whale, and it was, it happened in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and. Uh, you know, uh, the person who wrote uh, yeah, an account of this uh, encounter, he said that it's actually kind of willful attack by the uh, whale. So uh, the ship started to sink. So the people, the crew, frightened and they huddled inside uh, what's called a whale boat, small whale boat, and they had to make a quick decision. So. Uh, if they just turned left uh, towards east, if they had gone there, they could have arrived at what's called Marquis Island. Uh, that's in the uh, coast of near, near the coast of South America. If they had gone, uh, it's just it, it was the, like 1,200 kilometers. And uh, there was another option. If they had uh, sailed south. Uh, to read the course of so, uh, southern, uh, southern, uh, yeah, co coast of Australia actually, they had to travel 4,800 kilometers. So, the two decisions. Uh, but you know, the Marquis Islands, no one had gone there before. But they had, they had heard, this, heard stories of uh, cannibals. You know, to fight, they they could imagine themselves going there just to be eaten for the day. So if they, but if they had headed south, you know, it was 4,800 kilometers, just the sheer length of the journey would, you know, stretch their food supply and they would uh, sure to be starved to death. So these men, poor men, uh, the decision they make would decide, as you might find later, whether they would live or not. So what, uh, what, What's, what's next? What, so the, the sto this is a story. Uh, let, uh, tells the huge, gives us a good account of how our fear works, the irrationality of our fear. What kind of fear would motivate us for action? Why would 
Uh, let's say if I ask you if you need a refracture or if you need diabetes, most of you say you don't need a refracture. But you didn't know that refracture will heal in just two weeks. But diabetes is a lifelong illness. If you, if you can imagine something more vividly in your mind, you get more scared of it. So these poor people, scared of the cannibals, started to get south. Uh, because they were scared of cannibals. Uh, th their story later on uh, inspired Herman Melville to write the book Moby Dick. As he said in his sad commentary about this inspiring story, he says, um, after two months, when they were being rescued by another boat, uh, only two or three of the men were remaining and they had resorted to their own form of cannibalism. So, uh, this is what happens in fear. In the fear, uh, especially when it comes to a language, uh, when something, when you see a task, uh, if you can imagine yourself in a more dreadful situation, you will get more scared. So, if you wouldn't uh, look at the factual correctness of the story. So our, our fears, especially the anxiety, has a, uh, you know, the, its qualitative similarity to storytelling. Uh, it has a beginning, it has a body, and it has a kind of catastrophic ending. And we are, and there are characters like a story, and we are the characters in our fears. Uh, is, isn't that fascinating? Like, our fears, sometimes they predict future, That's the, that is the thing about our fears. Sometimes, once a while, they predict future. But most of the time, the story which uh, Move us mostly is not that actually exactly the correct, the factually correct story. So, uh, uh, when I read uh, Asanta's book, uh, several things I, I found very familiar to what I do. This is a story I would tell someone who has a phobia, like you know, fear of cockroaches, fear of public speaking, fear, fear of uh, someone who has a fear of uh, going to a crowded place. I would tell them the story to show them the irrationality of the fear. So when you, uh, and the worst thing about fear, in fact, is actually the fear of fear. Sometimes you are scared that you would be scared. You would tremble, you would sweat, you are scared that of that fear. That is one thing. Uh, when that happens, uh, what, uh, there, is a there is an interesting thing happening in our brain. You know, uh, yeah, before I forget, yesterday I was in the Columbus South University, uh, Columbus South Teaching Hospital, uh, examining some of the medical students. Uh, they were presenting their long cases uh, in psychiatry. So uh, these are the ones, the students, like, you know, they are very bright people, but most of them were like trembling and they were reading their history, and I was so frustrated to see them. Like, how did this happen after five years of training, after five years of you know, the torturing the words like by the consultants? How, how did this happen to these young, young people? Like still they struggle. So uh, I can see them when, when you struggle, you know what happened? They, they forgot the most, most basic stuff. And uh, very reluctantly, I could see in their face, you know, being the, uh, the empath I am, I could see the uh, you know, the suffering they already have in their life, but I had to add another suffering by failing them. You know, it, it, it was so sad to do that, but you know, no option. Uh, so this is what happens. When you, there is a part, you, your brain, uh, there is a part of your brain uh, uh, called, uh, uh, it's, uh, there is a thing called working memory. Working memory is like a computer RAM. It is the place where you would, uh, you would use to engage with the society or engage with the people. You would drag information fr uh, from the past to the working memory and you would assess the current situation and you would make the decision. So it is a limited, just like a RAM, it has a limited capacity. What happens when you are scared, most of your fear would occupy that RAM. Then what happens? Like the area which is remaining to function, to analyze the situation, you know, it is depleted. So it is compromised. So then you uh, uh, your functioning, you know, the performance would invariably go down. 
this is what happened, this is what's happening. So they look very incompetent, but when they are not, because they are scared. So this is this is the, this is a part of our brain called amygdala. Uh, amygdala is also called the emotional center. It's inside your brain, something like this. You go inside, here, yeah, it's inside your brain. It embedded inside in the deep, deepest tissues. This is the area, it, it's like a switch on of a light, switch of a light bulb. Uh, when you are scared or when you are, when you are happy even, when you are anxious, this will fire. The moment it, fire, it fires, uh, your rational part of the brain would shut down. This is what's happening. So you wouldn't remember things, you would, you would you know, uh, and then you get scared and it goes, it goes in a kind of a vicious cycle. You start to monitor yourself, when you start monitoring yourself, what happens to your fear? Then the moment you start monitoring yourself, the capacity to do the talk or do the performance, it will go down immediately because you know that limited space for that function. Then you get more scared. That when you get more scared, uh, you will get more anxious, and it is a downward spiral from there. So. Uh, a lot of things, uh, actually humans are the only species which can project ourselves into the future, an imaginary future, and make decisions. This is the reason why we, we have like kind of advanced as a species. We could see ourselves in hypothetical situations and then we can change the environment. Animals can't do this. They can only experience the present moment which is the most beautiful thing in the world actually. But we suffer. You know, this remarkable ability is a blessing as well as a curse. Because you can project yourself into hypothetical situations, you would uh, think of imaginary suffering in the future. This is called anxiety. Uh, you would think that you go there and one day this will happen and you know, the catastrophe. Then the, the story, you remember? This is like a story. You would think uh, the plane takes off, the engine fails and you fall. Then you get scared while you are seated in the brain. This is anxiety. Uh, so, a uh, lot of things I found very familiar. One of the things were like uh, this uh, approach where, where, uh, where you would approach a student who, uh, without correcting them. Uh, this ability uh, to you know, let them enhance their skills without you go there and interrupting and you know, showing them what is wrong and what is not. Uh, over and over, research has shown. Uh, when you go for this wrong correcting approach in the in teaching, uh, what happens? You do not become, uh, you won't improve someone by correcting their minute, minor uh, flaws. You can't do that. Uh, they have found that you can have a remarkable improvement in a smaller type if you just go on improving their good qualities. So they will have the, what's called, this thing called uh, self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a term uh, coined by a psychologist called Albert Bandura. Uh, Albert Bandura came up with this idea where self-efficacy is your ability to see yourself as a doer. Your ability to see someone who is guiding your own life. This is called self-efficacy. There is a proven way to improve someone's self-efficacy. We do that with, I do that with people who you know, have problems with heroin, alcohol. Uh, so I can't be there at home, you know, all the time with them when they are confronted with someone who would force them to drink. So if they have what's called self-efficacy, self they can reject them. You know, there is a way to improve self-efficacy. It is by letting them have small victories, like a uh, small, small group concept, where when they go and function in a small group, it will improve, it will habituate them, you know, like habituation is actually a, it's a kind of a spinal level. You become more, uh, you are, you expose someone to a more anxious uh, environment, then you find it's not anxious, then you become more okay, then it's like, you know, that our uh, anxiety and our old emotions have a kind of a waveform, you know, it has a, it has a beginning, it has a peak and it will end one day. But when you are caught up in that emotion, you don't see it. You don't see it as a way. You see, you think this is never going to end. This is too overwhelming. This is what happened. This is what's happening actually with all the anxiety, uh, anxiety disorders. 
while you are caught up in the anxiety, you can't see this is something which is going to end. Uh, so you want to do something, run away, or seek help, or avoid it altogether. Uh, so, but uh, more, when you habituate someone, let's say you get them to ex you get them exposed to it over and over again in a protective environment, uh, then that the you know the peak of that uh, wave, it will gradually decrease. Because they know the next time when it's happening, oh, last time nothing happened, I know this is going to, I'm going to be okay today. So the tomorrow, that belief will be even more stronger. So eventually, they will develop the skill. That is the idea of habituation. But even more than that, I think it is the, this cognitive change which occurs with the small victories, that you know, there is no scrutiny. Uh, no one is, uh, you know, like, you are not under the microscope of someone. So you can function on your own. So they develop themselves. So we, can, we have to step aside. You don't have to be there, you know, the teacher who is guiding the, the dictator, who is asking them to go this way or that way. They would find their own way. It's just once in a while, we can uh, step in and help them. That is the idea. Uh, and that I found it's a very psychologically uh, sound kind of a uh, way of teach, teaching. So uh, that is, uh, uh, so that's one thing, then uh, yes, uh, the cognitive change which occurs, this is the most beautiful thing actually, uh, this is, uh, there are, there is, there are certain things uh, in life, when you accomplish them, it will improve your ability to fight other things also, uh, like let's say, uh, uh, that is why exercising, uh, you know, the, mm, eating a healthy meal, uh, those things are important. Once you do those things, that is why people who are actually, even the students who are like, uh, who are good in sports are usually good in the academics. Because they, they, this will kind of, it has a kind of a, uh, uh, they, they, they can generalize this happiness or this competence into other areas. This is what ha this is what's happening. You when you let them uh, learn in this kind of an environment, their entire life will improve. And I think this is something. Uh, if we have this some, something like this, uh, if we are not if, like if we are still holding on to this, uh, you know, old archaic kind of teaching where they can't apply it to their real life. I think if we are holding it them, holding it them, holding it from them. I think it's a, uh, even I could say it's even a violation of uh, their fundamental rights. So uh, I hope uh, you would be able to uh, use this in a uh, like a more practical and uh, way where you would be able to disseminate this information. Uh, and one day we would see this kind of teaching everywhere.